Well, thanks, for, um, thanks to Vivian and thanks to the Mingna Institute for inviting me to this conference. Um, this talk will last for 21 minutes and contains racism, so um, I'm sorry about that. Um, I also feel woefully adequate talking about the subject because there are people in the audience who are actually Liverpoolians and I've only been a Liverpoolian for about three months. Um, so <laughs> so if, 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 there are any, if there's anything that is incorrect or contradicts with collective memories of people, then I do apologize before, beforehand. Um, okay, so I'm going to start. Okay. As a key port in global trade, and as the fabled second city of the British Empire, Liverpool has long had a culturally and ethnically diverse population. While most of the migrants were transitory labourers, that's it's a soundtrack for my talk. Um, sorry, while most of the migrants were transitory labourers, others did settle in the city. And by the 19th century, Liverpool was home to sizable populations of Europeans, Asians, and Africans, as well as people from other parts of the British Isles, Ireland, Scotland, and Wales. And the Chinese population in Liverpool, in particular, grew dramatically after the establishment of the Blue Funnel Line in the late 1860s, which provided the first direct steamship, steamship service between Liverpool and Shanghai by the Suez Canal, and which employed a large number of male Chinese sailors. And in light of the sexual relations between all the diverse groups and the local population in Liverpool, there were also significant numbers of mixed race people in the city by the early 20th century. While Liverpool has long boasted of its cosmopolitan character, in reality, many migrant groups were discriminated against and ghettoized, and by the early 20th century, a host of measures began to be implemented to prevent or discourage so-called undesirable aliens from engaging in relationships and having children with white women, or from coming to Britain altogether. For numerous politicians and scientists at the time, uh, informed by theories of eugenics and degeneration, racial miscegenation was an urgent social problem as it apparently threatened the social fabric and even compromised the strength of the British nation. And Anglo-African, Anglo-Chinese and Anglo-Indian folks, especially children and young adults, became objects of scientific scrutiny and intervention. So my paper today briefly introduces the history and legacies of racial mixing in Liverpool by concentrating on a handful of social scientific investigations from the 1920s and the 1930s on members of the Chinese community and their mixed race offspring. This is a slice of the history of thinking Chineseness, or if you like, unthinking Chineseness. But it was not the Chinese doing the thinking, rather the Chinese were being thought about by, well, white folks, white scientists. And um, the research that was done for this paper uh, was um, heavily indebted to scholars such as Lucy Bland and Leslie Hall, who have extensively uh, analyzed the history of British eugenics, to Gregor Benton, who has studied the history of Chinese immigrants and Chinatowns across Europe, my colleagues at University of Liverpool, John Belsham and Graham Mai, who have produced detailed accounts on Liverpool's diverse communities, the sociologist and anthropologist Mark Christian and Jacqueline Nassie Brown, who have dissected racism and racial relations in interwar Britain, and Jamin Caballero, whose work on ethnic mixing has been incorporated, as many of you might know, in the 2011 BBC documentary series Mixed Britannia. There are also many, many people who sort of looked into this, you know, for instance, Yvonne Foley, um, who has a website called um, halfandhalf.org, uh, which all of you guys should take a look at. Um, and of course, studying this history is only enabled by the collective memories of several generations of Liverpoolians and their op openness in sharing them with past and current researchers um, continually. Um, my starting point is the notorious 1919 race riots, which took place from January to August in, in 1999 in nine cities, London, Liverpool, Cardiff, Glasgow, Salford, Hull, South Shields, Newport, and Barry. In the wake of the First World War and demobilization, the surplus of labor led to widespread unemployment and resentment among British workers, particularly the seamen uh, at British seaports. 
African and Afro-Caribbean and Arab and South Asian and Chinese communities were targeted in a series of violent attacks, resulting in at least five fatalities and the vandalizing of many homes and properties. And there was the perception that these ethnic minorities were stealing the jobs that belonged to white indigenous British workers, even though the foreign laborers were often paid an exploitative wage and had to tolerate extremely poor and unsafe working and living conditions. And the political rhetoric at the time during the 1990 race riots was very much uh, British jobs for British people. Um, the white working class rioters were also fueled by the racist fantasy that these migrants were stealing their women and producing masses of monstrous or deformed offspring that would in time overwhelm the British nation. According to historian Lucy Bland, there were three major kinds of discourses on miscegenation being circulated in early 20th century Britain. First, the idea that miscegenation would generate abominations of nature, an act of transgression that is so great that it would perpetuate an endless cycle of violence between white and non-white people. The second racist fantasy was that the white women involved in these interracial unions were passive victims who were enslaved by the sexually predatory and vampiric black men or Chinese men or Indian men. Therefore, these women needed to be protected and rescued. But at the same time, the white women involved in interracial relationships were seen as degenerate undesirables who lacked all sense of morality and actively betrayed the nation through the active um, miscegenation. And black men, apparently, going, again according to this racist fantasy, lured white, men, uh, white women with their virility and hypersexuality, while Chinese men were apparently sinister and manipulative, essentially the Fu Manchu stereotype, and they trapped white women through addiction to opium or gambling. Uh, the third racist fantasy that was in circulation at the time was that the children from racial mixing, from racial mixing would inherit the worst traits from the father and the mother. The children would most likely be ugly and unattractive, and even those uh, half-caste boys and girls who appeared normal or maybe even exotically beautiful would, again, according to this racist fantasy, be necessarily unhealthy, immoral, lazy, stupid, restless, or even violent in nature. And these discourses of <laughs> racist fantasies were in turn fostered by eugenic theories, I'm not touching it, by eugenic theories and racial science, which purportedly offered objective explanations and solutions um, for these um, racist fantasies. Um, in response to the race riots, the Eugenic Society in London took the problem of miscegenation with absolute seriousness. Uh, in 1924, Cora Hodson, he was, at the time, the General Secretary of the Eugenic Society and the editor of the uh, Eugenics Review, which was a mouthpiece of the Eugenic Society of London, commissioned a scientific study on Anglo-Black and Anglo-Chinese children in the Merseyside region. The study was led by the anthropologist and geographer Herbert John Fleur, Fleur as in flower. He was professor of Aberystwyth and had, at that point, just published a book called The Races of England and Wales. Most of the research in Liverpool was actually conducted by Herbert Fleur's assistant, Rachel Fleming. The Eugenic Societies of, uh, of London, uh, their, their line, their approach, was that breeding between races defined as close in evolutionary, in evolutionary terms would be ideal, while interbreeding between wildly divergent races, so white with yellow, white with brown, and white with black, would result in the production of degenerate hybrids. And interbreeding between white and black races would be the worst under this eugenic theory. Um, and for Cora Hodson, the Eugenic Society General Secretary, the purpose of the Liverpool study would be to gather scientific evidence with which to pressurise the British government to legislate tougher anti-miscegenation laws, like what they had in America. In the 1920s, um, the British government operated voluntary repatriation programmes, which had a poor uptake, um, and the British government forced all aliens uh, to be registered with the police, and the marriage registrars under the order of the Foreign Office issued statements to British women to warn them uh, against marrying black, Salvation and Chinese men. White women who did marry foreign men against the British government's warning found themselves losing their citizenships and reclassified as aliens. Eminent members of Eugene society took the view that the repatriation of aliens had to be made compulsory, and some adopted the more extreme line that half-caste or to be sterilized alongside the insane and the feeble-minded. However, 
Herbert Fleur and Rachel Fleming, so the two anthropologists slash geographers who were doing this study in Liverpool, their perspective towards racial mixing was a little bit more ambivalent. So Fleur effectively argued in his work that all human beings were mixed, but stopped short of offering a coherent critique on the usefulness of race as a category of scientific classification. Fleming found the anti miscegenation laws in the United States utterly abhorrent. But Fleming, so Fleming disputed the idea that hybrid children inherited the worst traits from their parents. Nevertheless, Fleur and Fleming believed that interracial, interracial relationships and offspring necessarily led to, uh, quote, this harmony of physical and mental traits, and therefore ought to be actively discouraged through education and public information. At the level of research methodology, there were also tensions between the Eugenic Society of London and the Fleur Fleming team. Cora Hodgson wanted the duo to conduct mental testing on Anglo Chinese children using cutting edge, uh, what was at the time cutting edge, statistical and psychometric techniques developed by American eugenicist Charles Davenport and his colleagues at the Eugenics Record Office in Cold Spring Harbor in New York State. But Fleur um, and Fleming argued that American intelligence tests were unobjective because they presupposed the experimental subjects' familiarity with the English language. Instead, Fleur and Fleming insisted on an anthropometric approach and devised the study around the measurement of skull dimensions. Uh, in other words, the cephalic index, which is the ratio of the length to the width of the skull, which would corroborate or uh, correlate with its in intelligence. Uh, as well as facial features, so looking at the nose, the ears, the eyes and eyelids, the iris color, uh, skin color, hair color, and texture, and so forth. And a study on the so-called G factor of Anglo-Chinese children using verbal and non-verbal tests, so the Northumberland test and the Stevenson non-verbal test, that would not be carried out until 1938 by a certain PC who, uh, no idea who he is, at University College London, he was a student of Cyril Bird, um, PC who didn't do a dissertation uh, at UCL, so I, I couldn't quite figure out who he was, but I'll just need to dig a little bit deeper in the Cyril Bird papers, which are at UCL. Um, and uh, when PC who finally did this uh, IQ testing on, on Anglo-Chinese children, uh, in 1938, he discovered that, well, essentially there's no difference at all. Um, so anyway, so back to Fleur and Fleming, with the cooperation of the local women police patrols and the churches in Liverpool, uh, Herbert Fleur and Rachel Fleming located the measure around 100 children with Chinese fathers and white mothers in Liverpool, and around the same number of kids with black fathers and white mothers. They concluded that whereas Anglo-Chinese children could more easily pass as English and thus pose less of a visible threat to Liverpool locals, the majority of anglo back children had distinctly black physical characteristics that would make the integration into English life apparently difficult, if not impossible. Based on anecdotal evidence, Rachel Fleming remarked that some of the half-Chinese children were actually exceptionally talented and motivated, which was much to the surprise of the Eugenic Society of London. Through her contact with social workers, Rachel Fleming also found that white women regarded Chinese men as generous husbands and pragmatic fathers, more prepared to participate in domestic chores and child rearing, and less prone to becoming alcoholics or being violent. And on this last point, many white women therefore found Chinese men more preferable than white men as partners because they don't get drunk and they don't beat women up. Nevertheless, hybrid girls, Anglo-Black or Anglo-Chinese um, hybrid girls, were, according to Fleur and Fleming, in a deplorable situation, suffering from a lack of, a, of employment, uh, suffering from exposure to street dangers, and often became victims to tuberculosis or syphilis. These girls, these um, half-caste girls, according to uh, Fleur and Fleming, were the equivalent to mentally deficient English women, and therefore the social well-being had to be monitored and protected. At around the same time, the Liverpool University's settlement movement began to pay serious attention to the problem of half-caste children in the city. The Liverpool University settlement was founded in 1908 as part of the philanthropic concern of uh, university social reformers in the tradition of Toynbee Hall in London's Tower Hamlets. So Toynbee Hall was founded, was named after Arno Toynbee, who's Polly Toynbee's great-grandfather, I think. Um, so the Liverpool settlement brought together various interest groups to discuss current social issues. In 1927, a meeting was organized by the Liverpool University School of Social Science 
to debate the welfare of mixed children. The address was delivered by Rachel Fleming, who summarized her research on Anglo-Chinese and Anglo-Black children in Liverpool from three years earlier. And, re and in response to Fleur and Fleming's research, the Liverpool University Settlement established an executive committee, which was chaired by Professor of Geography Percy Roxby. And Percy Roxby uh, was a, a good friend of Joseph Needham, but that's a different story. Um, and in 1927, 1928, the executive committee led by Percy Roxby was formalized as the Liverpool Association for the Welfare of Half-Caste Children. And Percy Roxby and his colleagues launched an appeal to raise funds to hire a social worker who would investigate the plight of mixed Liverpoolian children. The association failed to reach its fundraising targets, and the money promised by the Laura Spellman Rockefeller Memorial Fund never materialized. Nevertheless, the association appointed Muriel Fletcher. Does that name ring a bell? Fletcher. Okay, Muriel Fletcher. He was trained at the School of Social Science at the University of Liverpool and was at the time working as a probational um, officer in Stoke on Trent. Um, so, Muriel Fletcher was to investigate Anglo Chinese and Anglo Black couples and the children in the Liverpool Docklands. What happened next caused incredible damage to racial relations in Liverpool for decades and became firmly etched in the collective memory of particularly African and Afro-Caribbean communities in Liverpool. As Muriel Fletcher studied the diverse communities in Liverpool for two years, she was actually welcomed into people's homes, she conducted extensive interviews with mothers and observed the children. Now, we do not know the perspective of the participants, but we can sort of speculate maybe that they initially thought that optimistically Fletcher, Muriel Fletcher, was giving them an opportunity to voice their experiences and perhaps challenge some of the pervading stereotypes of inter interracial relationships and families. Uh, in 1930, Fletcher published her findings in a report on an investigation into the colour problem in Liverpool and other ports, which became known as the Fletcher Report, the infamous Fletcher Report. Um, Percy Roxby, who commissioned the report, her out of it as probably the most thorough investigation of this particular problem that has so far been made. Um, at the outset, the Fletcher report bracketed out Anglo-Chinese children who, according to Fletcher, were well-adjusted and therefore not a social problem. But when it came to the black communities, Fletcher made um, a number of sensationalist claims. For instance, that 90% of the white women who entered into relationships with black men in Liverpool were mentally deficient or were prostitutes, which it's not true. For Fletcher, half-black children were a kind of perversion of nature. They inherited the slackness from their white mothers and the recklessness from their black fathers. The Fletcher report drew an extremely angry response from the League of Colored Peoples in London and from the black population in Liverpool, who felt that their trust had been violated. And Muriel Fletcher had to flee the city for her own safety, and the Liverpool Association for the Welfare of Hackers Children was soon disbanded. As a result of the Fletcher episode, the black community in Liverpool held a distrustful, if not hostile, attitude towards the University of Liverpool, and this broken relationship did not heal until around two or three decades ago. Um, the Fletcher report led to a diverting of attention in Liverpool away from mixed children and racial science onto the more general question of immigration and social integration. So in 1934, David Caradoc Jones published a free volume work entitled The Social Survey of Merseyside. Taking uh, Liverpool's diverse communities into the wider immigration context, the problem of black immigration and Chinese immigration into Merseyside was actually comparatively small, as the number of people from Eastern Europe and from Ireland actually far outstripped those from other places anyway. And Jones came to the conclusion that overall, the immigrants, all of the immigrant communities in Liverpool, actually made positive contributions to the city's economy compared to local populations, immigrants, including Chinese immigrants, were in regular employment and were actually less likely to slide into poverty. Again, Jones emphasized that while Anglo-Chinese young men and women had few problems securing employment or starting families, Anglo-black folks, by contrast, had significantly greater difficulties in achieving either. However, instead of claiming that there was something biologically wrong, inherently wrong, with Anglo-black men and women, Caradoc Jones already shifted towards a more sociological and environmental explanation. In the mid-1930s, with the rise of European fascism and race as a scientific category began to be criticized from within the eugenic society, 
Ideas about the harmful effects of miscegenations were largely discredited after the Second World War. There was, however, a final tragic twist to the story. In the early 1940s, an estimated 20,000 Chinese sailors were recruited into the British Merchant Navy. Many settled in the Liverpool Docklands and married or cohabited with local women. After the Second World War, these Chinese, the, these Chinese sailors were regarded as troublemakers by the British government and by Liverpool's shipping companies because they, they became unionized and started to demand equal pay as local sailors. In 1945, the Home Office devised a plan to repatriate undesirable Chinese aliens from Liverpool. By 1946, an estimated 1,300 Chinese men were rounded up by crack squads led by the special branch, sometimes in the middle of the night, and shipped back to Hong Kong, Shanghai, Fuzhou, and other places. More than 200 Chinese men with dependents, uh, English wives and Anglo-Chinese children, were suddenly and forcefully repatriated, leaving behind distraught families who believed themselves abandoned. As a result, as well, many of the members of the Chinese community in Liverpool also relocated to Manchester in the 1940s. By way of conclusion, I would like to come back to the theme of the conference, which is thinking Chinese. The aim of this task was not to showcase the terrible racism that was embedded in some of the purportedly scientific thinking from the early 20th century and then pat ourselves on our shoulders for hopefully not thinking about Chinese or Anglo-Chinese people in eugenic terms anymore and hopefully that this society is not as racist as it once was. I mean, I'm not going to jump on a political bandwagon here, but don't vote UK. Um, the story of racial miscegenation showed that in early 20th century Britain, attempts at investigating and defining Chineseness by white men and women of science simultaneously entailed investigating and defining blackness and whiteness. In this scheme, being Chinese or Anglo-Chinese lies somewhere between being white and being black. The praise for the Chinese for having a set of positive traits, being enterprising, resilient, hardworking, exemplary immigrants, and so on and so forth, often simultaneously entail the condemnation of Africans and Afro-Caribbeans for allegedly failing to integrate and adjusting themselves into English society. Mixed Anglo-Chinese people, again, according to uh, the logic of racial science, could at best pass off as being English or perform Englishness to an adequate degree, but could never become genuinely English despite having an English mother or an English father. The history of thinking Chineseness, or maybe even the history of unthinking Chineseness, is therefore intimately tied to the history of thinking blackness or unthinking blackness and thinking whiteness or unthinking whiteness. Now, it's easy to congratulate ourselves for our more progressive values, and it's difficult to argue against Chinese and Anglo-Chinese people who now have the agency and power to define their own identities, to claim their own cultural heritage, and have the sense of belonging to which they are perfectly entitled. However, in the process of thinking Chineseness, at this event today and on future occasions maybe, we probably, uh, maybe, should have to perform a simultaneous thinking and unthinking. By unthinking, I don't mean um, not thinking, I mean a kind of a deconstruction as well as a construction. Um, because it is only with a simultaneous construction and deconstruction of what it means to be Chinese that we are not simply reproducing essentialism at the level of culture as opposed to biology. And in a sense, I believe we're all cultural miscegenants. And uh, I'm going to quote uh, Nathaniel Coleman in the corner that we all have a duty to miscegenate. And thank goodness for that. Thank you very much for listening.